Uh, okay, so if you're just joining us, uh, quickly grab some pizza. Um, we are, as you know, uh, in a new room for the CAP seminar, so I'm glad you all found this place. But with the new room comes uh, a few directives from Tedra Tuttle, our, our facilities manager here. Um, you cannot drop any pizza on the fresh new carpet or Tetra will be very annoyed with you. Um, also, if you are a grad student, the cost of having pizza for free is that you have to help us take the empty trash can, empty boxes once we're done at the hour out to the, the, uh, the dumpster. Uh, so don't disappear. I do know where you all work. So uh, I will come find you. Uh, and with that, uh, let's introduce not our speaker, but our speaker's protege. Uh, so uh, as you all know, uh, we have a new CAPS fellow this year who has just been here for a week, Cynthia Trendefilova, uh, comes to us um, having done her PhD at, at uh, the University of Texas, uh, working with John Kilich. Uh, and she went off then to work uh, with, uh, at SMU, in, also in Texas, on uh, CMB experiments. Um, and she was working with a distinguished speaker, her advisor, uh, Joel Myers, who she'll uh, have the privilege of introducing. So, Cynthia. Um, yeah, I'm the new CAPS fellow. And I'm very excited today to introduce our speaker, Joel Myers. Um, Joel also did his PhD at UT Austin um, with Steven Weinberg. And he was then a postdoc at CETA in Canada, studying cosmology. And he's now a professor at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, working on all sorts of exciting cosmology research. And today he'll be telling us about the bright future of CMB science. All right. Well, thanks very much for that introduction and for also for the invitation to be here. It's really great um, to be here. Um, I was here about five years ago or so, um, and it's, it's great to be back, really, really great place. Um, <clears throat> so as Cynthia said, I'll be talking today about the exciting new future of cosmic microwave background science. Um, <clears throat> the cosmic microwave background and observations thereof have played a huge role in shaping our understanding of the history, evolution, and contents of the universe. And from our observations of the CMB, um, cosmologists like to say we have a very good understanding of about 13.8 billion years of cosmic history. However, when you look a little bit more closely, our direct observations are limited to a much smaller range in temperature or energy scales. Uh, we only observe um, galaxies and structure formation um, in, the, in the relatively recent cosmic past, phrased in terms of scale factor or energy or temperature. And then we have some indirect observations that stretch back into higher energies. But that still leaves unknown this very large section of the very early universe, which um, may hold the key to understanding some of the big puzzles that are left out of our current understanding of the universe, um, things that relate to things like the nature of dark matter and the fundamental constituents of our universe. So part of the goal of this talk is to discuss how we can leverage observations of the cosmic microwave background formed here in this timeline to indirectly learn about this much earlier period of cosmic evolution, and then also to talk about how we can use observations of the cosmic microwave background to get complementary probes of the lower redshift universe. Um, here's a quick outline of the talk. I'll start with a very rapid review of the basics of cosmic microwave background science. I'll move on to discuss the current status and future timeline for CMB surveys. Um, I'll talk then about how the upcoming, the precision of these upcoming surveys presents both new opportunities and new challenges, and I'll focus specifically on gravitational lensing as an example of that multifaceted aspect of the new data, the new precision. Um, and then I'll focus on some science cases, starting with discussion of cosmic neutrinos, and then moving on to new light relics, and then I will discuss how that motivates um, a new technique to analyze the cosmic microwave background focused on delensing. And then I'll discuss some new opportunities that are presented by the high precision data we expect to collect in upcoming surveys uh, focused on secondary anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background. All right, so with that being said, let me very quickly review the basics of CMB science. Um, so the cosmic microwave background is the leftover afterglow of the Big Bang. Um, it was formed um, when the universe transitioned from being filled with a, uh, an opaque plasma. Um, the hydrogen recombined 
and formed a neutral gas, allowing the photons that had been rattling around with the electrons uh, prior to that to, to propagate freely. And those photons, which have been propagating freely ever since about 380,000 years um, into the hot Big Bang evolution of the universe, uh, make up the cosmic microwave background that we observe today to have a very nearly perfect black body spectrum. Uh, and the fact that this spectrum agrees so well with the perfect black body gives very strong support to the general idea of the hot Big Bang cosmology. But our observations of the CMB do much more than that. Um, there's a huge amount of information carried in the um, anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background. We break down that information into the temperature anisotropies and the polarization. The polarization can be broken down into two pieces, the E-mode polarization, which is curl-free, and the B-mode polarization, which is divergence-free. Um, and in addition to the temperature and primary polarization fluctuations, um, the CMB also carries information about all the imprints of the stuff that intervenes between us and the primary CMB, the surface of last scattering. Um, the way we typically analyze CMB data is we map out those anisotropies across the whole sky. And this is so a map of the whole sky taken from the Planck satellite um, and the temperature fluctuations, the deviations from the mean temperature. And we look at all these uh, little speckles and we are interested not so much in the position of where those speckles are on the sky, but rather the statistics. And the reason for that is that our theories of the early universe predict the statistics, but not the distribution of, of these anisotropies. Um, and because, the, uh, because of the, um, the nature of these statistics are very, very nearly Gaussian, almost all of the information is coded in the two-point statistics of these fluctuations. And so we take the two-point correlation function, we take its angular transform, and that results in the so-called um, angular power spectrum, which is shown here. So the temperature angular power spectrum is up here, and then um, the E modes. And then here are some examples of B mode polarization power spectra that we would expect for various levels of primordial gravitational wave amplitude. So the B modes are one of the focus, uh, a, a key focus for upcoming um, cosmic microwave background surveys that I'll come back to in a little while. Um, but we analyze the bumps and wiggles of these T and E uh, mode power spectra that we have observed very precisely. Um, those bumps and wiggles are the result of acoustic modes, sound waves propagating through the plasma in the early universe. And if you change the medium through which those sound waves propagate, or you change the initial conditions, or you change the expansion since the surface of last scattering, you will affect the shape of the bumps and wiggles. And so we can analyze very precisely the way that these spectra look and infer the things about the initial conditions, um, the density, the, con uh, the contents of the universe and its evolution. When we do that, we, uh, so the of those power spectra, and we can analyze very precisely those shapes to infer that um, um, how those modes evolved. And what we get is a picture of the universe, uh, which, is, which is pretty startling. Uh, we get the so-called flat lambda CDM model, which is a model that's described by a universe which is spatially flat, whose current energy density is dominated by some form of dark energy consistent with the cosmological constant. Um, and the matter content is made primarily of some sort of non-baryonic dark matter component with the ordinary stuff of everyday experience, ordinary matter, making up only a small fraction of the total matter density, the total energy budget of the universe. So already the CMB has been hugely influential in, in establishing this standard model of cosmology that leaves open some big puzzles. We don't know the nature of dark energy. We don't know the nature of dark matter. And the goal of upcoming observations is to push beyond um, this simple parameterization to really understand the nature of these various constituents. Um, all right, and so that's kind of the standard analysis. That's, that's a very, very rapid overview of the state of the field and how we typically analyze CMB data. Let me now look forward and, and say a, a bit about upcoming CMB surveys, which will push much beyond um, that, that analysis that I've discussed so far. This is a timeline of the current ongoing experiments. So uh, 2022 is this vertical uh, red line here. And what you can see is there are a set of ground-based experiments that are currently taking data um, from Chile in brown and from the South Pole in blue. Um, and then moving to the right is the set of future surveys that are planned for the next um, decade or so, um, or more than decade. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you can also see some proposed uh, satellite missions down here in gray. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna focus primarily on the science that's achievable with Simons Observatory, um, CMBS4, and experiments like CMBHD and, and PICO. 
Um, I put stars next to those. Those are the ones I'm going to focus on because I'm members of all of those, uh, but also because of the type of observations that are, that are done by these uh, focus on small angular scales, and you'll see why that's important as we, as we move forward here. Um, and sorry, I should say that I'm going to focus primarily on CMBS4. Um, I'm the Science Council co-chair of S4, so um, that's why my focus lies there. Uh, but I'll use that as a concrete example to motivate the targets that I'll be discussing as we go forward. So with that being said, let me say a little bit about how CMBS4 is designed and what it's capable of. Um, so CMBS4 is envisioned to be a dual site um, and dual resolution experiment uh, made up of a set of ultra-deep surveys that will take place from the South Pole with a large aperture telescope aimed at measuring small angular scale fluctuations in polarization and um, a set of small aperture telescopes. And the goal of this survey is to focus on one very narrow patch of sky from the South Pole, uh, which is possible only from the South Pole where you can stare at the same patch for very long periods of time. And <clears throat> the scientific motivation for these surveys is to go after the primordial gravitational wave signal as seen through the B-mode polarization um, that I showed on an earlier slide. Um, from Chile, there will be a deep wide survey conducted with a pair of large aperture telescopes that will scan a much larger fraction of the sky um, and will do so in high resolution. So the plan is to cover about 70% of the sky accessible from Chile. Um, and you can see that the band here overlaps prominently with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of upcoming and ongoing galaxy surveys. Um, and I'll discuss uh, why we've designed the survey this way and the types of science that we can get primarily from this, uh, from this wide survey rather than from the deep survey for the most of this talk. Now, the science that we envision doing with CMBS4 can be broadly in, broken down into four categories. Um, primordial gravitational waves and inflation, primarily through the B-mode polarization that I briefly discussed, um, mapping matter in the cosmos, the dark universe, and the time variable millimeter wave sky. I'll have something to say about the first three of these categories. Uh, I'll only very briefly say that the, the time uh, variable millimeter wave sky is another interesting um, new discovery space for cosmic microwave background science, which of course many people here at Illinois are heavily involved in. I unfortunately won't have time to talk, uh, talk about all the exciting stuff that can be done here, um, but you're probably all more experts in it than I am anyway. Uh, so I'll focus primarily on these other three science cases. And um, the kind of the main goal I'd like to, to drive at is that um, the precision of these upcoming surveys, like CMBS4, uh, provides a huge range of new opportunities, but also the high precision of the data will um, uh, present new challenges um, associated with extracting as much information as we can about um, particle physics, cosmology, and astrophysics. And so I'll discuss how the increased precision in data opens up new windows, but also presents new obstacles that we have to surmount in order to maximize the science that we can achieve with these upcoming surveys. All right, and so as a concrete example of both the new challenges and new opportunities that are presented by um, upcoming high precision data of the CMB, let me focus on one specific case of gravitational lensing of the CMB. So gravitational lensing of the CMB refers to the deflection of CMB photons as they travel from the surface of last scattering to our telescopes by variations in the gravitational potential along our line of sight. Um, that gravitational potential is sourced by all the stuff, the structure in our universe, and so it's a guaranteed uh, prediction of standard cosmology. It causes us to have a distorted view of the cosmic microwave background. And the way that this actually works in practice is here's a simulation of a 10, uh, uh, sorry, a five, five by five degree simulated patch of sky in E-mode polarization and B-mode polarization. And for this particular simulation, we've chosen to set the primordial gravitational wave amplitude to zero, such that the unlensed B-mode polarization is zero. And we're going to lens this patch of sky using a, polariz uh, sorry, using a, using a gravitational potential that looks like this. And if I flip back and forth, you can see um, that the lens CMB is subtly different. Um, the most prominent change is that the B-mode polarization is no longer zero. Um, and that's because the um, deflection of the photons from the lensing um, has caused the E-mode pattern to get distorted into a B-mode pattern. Uh, the E-mode polarization also subtly changes, um, and that's easier to see if I flip back and forth. You can see that there are shifts um, to the various locations of uh, the hot spots and cold spots in the E-mode polarization. 
And if you look more closely, you can actually tell that the B mode polarization um, that is generated by the conversion of E mode into B mode polarization is correlated with the E modes and then also with the lensing deflection. We can use that change to the statistics that's imprinted by this distortion of the unlensed CMB to reconstruct the lenses. That is, we can infer, knowing, that this, knowing what the statistics of the unlensed CMB are, we can infer the fact that this CMB that we observe has been distorted by the presence of this lensing field. And what that allows us to do is to reconstruct a map of all of that deflection, and therefore a map of the integrated mass density throughout the whole universe. The Planck team has done this across a very large fraction of sky and made a 40 sigma observation of the integrated mass density, which because, is, uh, because the mass density in the universe is dominated by dark matter, this is effectively giving us an integrated, um, uh, integrated density of dark matter throughout the universe. Uh, yes? Super naive question, because this is not my field of expertise, but the CMB data is a snapshot at this moment, mm -hmm. right? Tedra's going to be mad. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I think it's just the people on Zoom. Oh, okay. I guess we care about people on Zoom. Yeah. So how does, uh, does that play into the picture here? Uh, it, it, uh, it affects the way that we predict the lensing that we should get, um, but uh, the evolution doesn't impact, let's see, what am I trying to say? So. Um, I say this is an integrated mass density, but it's uh, the way that you should interpret this mass density is that we are getting things only on our past light cone. And so like if you looked, yeah, it's, um, what am I trying to say? If you, if you looked out, say, to uh, hundreds of, or, or tens of gigaparsecs away, um, you would have knowledge about what that piece of the universe looked like as these photons passed it, but you wouldn't know what it looks like now, even though now is kind of a funny question in, in general relativity. Um, so yes, the evolution of the universe impacts what we see in maps like this, because the structure has been forming throughout the history of the universe. And as a result of that, this lensing map is actually dominated by structures not where the lensing kernel peaks at about two uh, redshift of two, but actually at slightly lower redshift because structure has been forming throughout that time. So there are more structures at later time than at the time than halfway between us and the CMB. I'm not sure if I totally answered your question, but okay. Um, good. So um, Planck has a. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> got it, got it. Um, so the Planck team has measured this at 40 sigma, already very high significance. Um, upcoming observations will drastically improve our ability to measure to, and re reconstruct these lenses. Um, and we expect to have cosmic variance limited measurements of the lensing up to about L of 1,000. Um, and that means that uh, its role in our ability to infer science from the CMB will be enhanced. And lensing plays a dual role in our ability to infer science from the CMB. On the positive side, the CMB lensing field is sensitive to the growth of cosmic structure throughout the history of the universe. And so while we measure the CMB, which is just a 2D screen at some very large distance, the fact that lensing, the fact that structures have imprinted this deflection, this distortion on the CMB means that we actually get some information about much lower redshift, um, the, the much lower, lower redshift universe by measuring the lensing. And so that's a positive thing. The CMB contains information not only about the high redshift, but about the low redshift universe. On the flip side, lensing distorts um, our view of the pristine unlensed CMB. And so for things that we care about, uh, like B-mode polarization, where we really need to know what it looked like before the distortion, lensing is an obstacle to extracting the science we want to extract. So lensing plays this dual role. It allows a sensitivity to the low redshift universe, but it hinders a pristine view of the early universe. And so we have to uh, address um, this, this role of lensing, and right now it's at about 40 sigma, but it'll be hundreds of sigma with upcoming data, and so we need to make sure that we're um, both leveraging everything we can out of, the len uh, out of the lensing field, but also removing it where we want to do science that really relies on a pristine view of the, of the last scattering surface. So uh, regarding the, so you're gonna get a lens, you get a lensing map, right? Mm -hmm. You get like a density map. Uh, and the one from Plague was at, at 40 sigma. That's right. And so that's, 
fairly precise. That's right. right? Because mm -hmm. in, you know, in a way, you don't really know what you're seeing because you're not really seeing what you're supposed to be seeing because it's all been distorted. That's now, right. how well, how confident is it that you can really understand your distortions so they, then you can understand what you really are seeing? Are we going to get to how close or what percentage of precision do you think we're eventually going to get? Yeah, good. So I will have more to say about that in kind of the latter half of the talk. Um, what I can say is the reason the whole procedure works is because we think we know the statistics of the unlensed CMB and we know the physics of lensing. That is, we know how gravity bends, uh, bends the trajectory of photons. And so all we need is this map and knowledge of the statistics in the absence of lensing in order to make the, to make the process possible. I will be more quantitative about how well we can do with that procedure later on. All right, um, good, so lensing plays this dual role. I should very briefly mention, I'll touch on this later, it's not only lensing for which um, this is an important thing. There are other sources of distortions to the, uh, to the uh, pristine CMB that have this same sort of dual role where we can learn new things from measuring it, but it also hinders the pristine view of the, of the um, primary CMB. All right, so let's now turn first to a case where lensing is a benefit to our observations, and that is in measurements of cosmic neutrinos. Um, so cosmic neutrinos are a, um, an important way that we might get leverage on neutrino mass, on specifically the absolute mass scale of neutrinos. We know very precisely from neutrino flavor oscillation experiments that neutrinos are massive, and we measure the mass squared splittings of those eigenstates um, based on these flavor oscillation experiments. But there are a few things we don't know. We don't know the um, um, absolute mass scale, and we don't know the ordering, whether it's a normal ordering or an inverted ordering. That is, we don't know the sign of one of these, uh, of one of these mass squared splittings. Um, what cosmology is sensitive to is the sum of neutrino masses. And in these two cases, we have a minimum mass where you take the lowest one to zero, and in the normal ordering, that implies a, a minimum sum of masses of about 60 MeV, and in the inverted ordering, about 105 MeV. Um, now, um, if you ask a cosmologist why this is interesting, um, it'll, uh, you'll typically get the answer that this is really, really difficult or impossible to measure in the lab, to measure the absolute mass scale of neutrinos. Um, that doesn't, that's, a, that's true, but it's not really an answer to why we might care about the number. And in fact, we already have a pretty good um, set, a pretty tight range on the absolute mass scale of neutrinos because we measure these mass squared splittings. And the current constraint from Planck data is not so far above, uh, above these things. So we already kind of know the mass scale. Things aren't going to change by factors of 10 on the mass scale of neutrinos. Um, and but, so if you push a little bit harder to a cosmologist, why do we care about this measurement? They might, you might then get the answer that cosmology might be able to weigh in on this question of whether it's the normal ordering or the inverted ordering. And that's also true, but only in a limited sense. Um, it's only true if nature is kind and the um, nature has chosen the normal ordering and also that the mass is near the minimal amount. And furthermore, the precision which, with, with which in that scenario we could distinguish between the normal ordering and the inverted ordering is a lower significance than we can just measure the mass. Um, and furthermore, um, the global fits to uh, flavor oscillation data already favor normal ordering at about three and a half sigma. Um, so I've just kind of explained to you uh, the, the typical arguments you hear, all of which are kind of going in the negative direction. Why do we care about neutrino mass? Um, uh, from cosmology. And so what I'd like to argue is that there are valuable reasons to measure neutrino mass from cosmology, and they basically break down into three categories. Uh, first, there is the particle physics argument. That is, do we actually care about the mass of neutrinos? And the answer is yes, uh, we do actually care. And um, there are, there are uh, reasons that model builders care about the mass of neutrinos. Those questions are effectively already answered to some degree by uh, the narrow range that we have. But additionally, we care to set targets for other means by which we can measure neutrino mass. In particular, um, things like beta decay endpoint measurements of neutrino mass, and also neutrino list double beta decay measurements. Um, right now, we don't have a solid target for what to look for in those things. Cosmology constrains things horizontally on this, uh, on this plot. Neutrino list double beta decay constrains things in principle vertically on this plot. If we get a, me a measurement horizontally on this plot from cosmology, that sets a target for these neutrinoless double beta decay experiments. 
So there's a lot of complementarity with lab-based searches for the effects of neutrino mass. We also care because the measurement, the cosmological measurement of neutrino mass is actually a very tight end-to-end -to -end, um, uh, -end -end test of our cosmic history. As I'll describe in a moment, the way in which we measure the effects of neutrino mass in cosmology rely on several, uh, rely on a deep understanding of the way that our universe has evolved throughout its entire history. And furthermore, there are other new species like massive gravitinos that would show up in very similar ways to the effects of neutrino mass. And by making the measurement of neutrino mass, we are naturally constraining all of those additional physics beyond the standard model. And finally, it's also useful for astrophysics to make this cosmological measurement of neutrino masses. Again, because of the way that we actually measure neutrino mass, um, it enters as um, a, a parameter that's a source of confusion for other things that can impact um, observations of structure on the scales relevant for the observation. If we can measure the absolute mass scale of neutrinos in cosmology, and in particular, if we can do it in multiple ways, we can disentangle um, the effects of neutrino mass from other physics, like the evolution of dark energy, um, spatial curvature, uh, modified gravity that can also impact the growth of structure. And so for all these reasons, the measurement of the absolute mass scale of neutrinos in cosmology is one that's valuable, um, even if you don't care about neutrinos themselves. So to make that point a little bit more clear, let me walk through the way in which we measure the absolute mass scale of neutrinos in cosmology to elucidate how it is that we can use it for these other things, even if you don't care about neutrinos. So first of all, the, the, the reason cosmology is sensitive to the physics of neutrino mass is very strongly tied to the existence of the cosmic neutrino background. So cosmic neutrinos um, were formed in the early universe, much like the, the photons that make up the microwave background. Specifically, cosmic neutrinos were held in thermal equilibrium at very high temperatures above about 1 MeV when the weak nuclear force was sufficiently uh, effective to keep neutrinos in thermal equilibrium with the thermal plasma in the early universe. They fell out of equilibrium at neutrino decoupling, uh, about 1 MeV. Shortly after that, electrons and positrons annihilated um, and passed their entropy to photons, thereby heating photons relative to the neutrinos. So it's important to mention that neutrinos, after they decoupled from the plasma, didn't just disappear, but they began a free expansion. And so the electron-positron annihilation heated the photons relative to the neutrinos, but the neutrinos still exist. They exist as a thermal relic. And we can calculate their relative temperature, their relative density, their relative number, um, compared to that of photons. We measure the photons very precisely. Oh, I'm sorry, I should say the factor by which those things are related. The temperature of neutrinos is related to the temperature of the photons by a factor of 4 11 to the 1 3rd. We measure the photon temperature very precisely. And so that Im uh, implies that the neutrino temperature today um, is about 1.95 Kelvin, or about 10 to the minus 4 eV, which means that the universe is full of a very high number density of very low momentum um, neutrinos. And because of that, they were um, born hot. They were born relativistic. But this small temperature is below at least two mass eigenstates, which means that some fraction of the cosmic neutrinos are non-relativistic today. Okay? Um, so cosmology provides us with this huge abundance of non-relativistic neutrinos, which are really hard to get in the lab. And so we can look for the imprints of that very large source of non-relativistic neutrinos. Um, and what those non-relativistic neutrinos do, because they were born hot, but contribute to the matter density today, they act not like cold dark matter, which clusters and forms, the, forms halos in, in which galaxies form. Instead, they act like hot dark matter. They have very large free streaming lengths, um, and they don't cluster on small scales. And so compared to a universe in which neutrinos are massless, a, um, a universe containing massive neutrinos sees less structure growth on small scales compared to large scales and early times. And it's this suppression of structure growth that we look for in most probes of neutrino mass in cosmology. So what we need to do is compare the um, amplitude of structure growth, the, the matter power spectrum on small, uh, small length scales and compare it to um, that on large scales and early times. The way we do that with the CMB is through the measurement of CMB lensing. So again, CMB lensing 
is um, sourced by all the structure throughout the universe. So if I change the amplitude of that structure growth, I change the amplitude of the CMB lensing power spectrum. Um, and neutrino mass is one way in which that thing, uh, the amplitude gets changed. And so what I'm showing here is that we just take the statistics of the CMB lensing map, the two-point statistics, and produce a power spectrum, the same way that I showed for the T and E uh, power spectra. And what I'm showing you here is the change to the lensing power spectrum for a universe containing the minimal mass of neutrinos um, as compared to one in which there are, uh, the neutrinos are massless. And you can see that you get this suppression of the matter power spectrum as viewed through the lensing power spectrum. These big blue error bars are what we expect from a CMBS4-like reconstruction of the CMB lensing uh, power spectrum. And you can see by eye, without doing any fancy statistics, that this would be a very high significance measurement of the effects of neutrino mass. Now, it turns out there are some degeneracies which, which, um, which mean that we can't actually infer it with as much precision as you would do by eye here. But we can, uh, depending on the observation of the optical depth tau, uh, we can get either a two, to, uh, a two to four sigma measurement of the uh, impact of neutrino mass with something like CMBS4. All right, and so I should say, um, uh, the reason that this is a valuable test of all those other things that I said is because this suppression can result from all sorts of other things. It relied on the fact that neutrinos were produced hot in the early universe. They underwent free expansion and don't cluster at late times. So if you screw up the thermal history, if you throw in extra ingredients, all sorts of stuff can cause this story to go awry. Um, and so by uh, thinking carefully about the way um, that we're actually making this measurement, we can infer much more than just the properties of neutrinos by making the measurement of the, of the suppression of matter from neutrino mass. Yes. Uh, I have also a very naive question, sorry. Uh, how do cold neutrina interact, I mean, in non-gravitational way? How it is different from neutrinos we have from sun, for example? Yeah, great. So um, the, the short answer is that we typically expect neutrinos to be involved in the weak interaction, whether that be scattering or inelastic processes, like conversion of, of nuclei. Um, Typically, those effects scale as the neutrino momentum squared. Um, and so uh, typically, you expect that they'll have effectively negligible interactions in almost all processes. There are notable exceptions. Um, so thresholdless processes, um, so-called induced beta decay, doesn't have a threshold. Um, and that's been proposed as a way to search for um, the very low energy cosmic neutrino background. Um, in, in, to be a little bit more concrete, there's a proposal called Ptolemy, which is aimed at uh, using uh, a, large, a large amount of tritium uh, to look for induced beta decay of the tritium due to incoming neutrinos from the cosmic neutrino background. And you could distinguish those beta decays from the ordinary spontaneous beta decay because the energy of the electron given off in that process would be greater than the Q value of the transition by an amount that's equal to the neutrino energy for low velocity neutrinos, that's the neutrino mass. And so you, you expect you have this, um, like the tritium is gonna be beta decaying all the time, you expect to see you know, some distribution, but then if there's these induced beta decays, there's a little bump that's off the end of the spectrum that can only come from an incoming particle in the, in the initial state to give it that extra energy. Uh, yeah, it's a very ambitious proposal. It's, uh, it's really cool physics. They're actually experiencing some challenges about whether it can actually work. Uh, but it's, anyway, it's a proposal to actually observe directly the cosmic neutrino background through non-gravitational means. All right. So the next topic I'm going to move on to is, is one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, it's extremely valuable for physics beyond the standard model. And that's a measurement of the light relic density in cosmology. Now, uh, light relics refer to all radiation-like species apart from photons that were present um, in the early universe. Um, within the standard model, cosmic neutrinos are a contribution, make a contribution to the light relic density. And we can predict, as I said, we can predict this contribution of the cosmic neutrino background to the light energy density. We typically parameterize it through a quantity called N effective. Um, and uh, N effective is defined such that um, if neutrinos had, had decoupled instantaneously in the kind of way that I showed in the previous slide, that this number would just count the number of families of neutrinos. 
Now, even in the standard model, that instantaneous decoupling picture is not completely precise. And so the, um, there's some residual couplings um, as neutrinos uh, undergo a, a transition from being coupled to decoupled. That means that in the standard model, the prediction for N effective is a little bit larger, 3.044 instead of exactly three um, because of the three families of, of neutrinos. Um, what I'm showing here is the neutrino last scattering surface, which looks very different from the cosmic microwave background last scattering surface. So the CMB last scattering surface occurs because the fraction of uh, free electrons drops very rapidly. Thomson scattering is energy independent, and so you get a very sharp um, uh, last scattering surface that's energy independent. For neutrinos, the process is different. Um, the, when the weak interaction goes out of equilibrium, it goes out of equilibrium in a temperature-dependent way. And so you can see that the, the cosmic neutrino background last scattering surface is energy-dependent, and it's spread over a much wider range um, in, in uh, Hubble times, for example. Um, uh, this is a little bit of, a, of an aside, but I'll just say that uh, we are in the process of developing a, a, a compact formalism to deal with that um, decoupling process and the small spectral distortions that you anticipate from it. And this is actually observable to some degree in the sense that um, neutrinos in, uh, around these times um, interact not just gravitationally, but also through the weak interaction, in particular by interconverting neutrons and protons. This is the evolution of the neutron to proton ratio. And that plays a significant role in the form, uh, formation of the light element abundances. Um, and uh, there are many experts here about BBN um, and what it can do to constrain physics beyond the standard model. And that, constraint, or th that constraining power becomes even more useful when you combine it with, with CMB probes of the same sort of physics. So let me return to new light relics. So beyond the cosmic neutrino background, we are interested in searching for new contributions to the light relic density. And there's a host of uh, very well-motivated examples of new light species. Um, that are motivated not just by saying what else could be there, but motivated by um, problems involving um, things like the strong CP problem. So axions and axion-like particles are concrete particle physics uh, motivated models to solve the strong CP problem. And these things might show up as a contribution to the light relic density. Light relics also show up in complex dark sectors. So if you have interactions in your dark sector, rather than just one simple particle that, um, that redshifts and doesn't interact, if you have some interactions in your dark sector, those dark forces are typically mediated by light particles in the dark sector, and that contributes to the dark radiation density, the light relic density. Um, and furthermore, sterile neutrinos have been proposed for all sorts of anomalies that arise in flavor oscillation experiments. And if those neutrinos are, those sterile neutrinos are light, they also contribute to the light relic density. So these are some concrete examples, concrete, well-motivated examples of sources of new light relics, but there are many more. Um, one can you know, look at, uh, there, these are some SNOMAS and uh, Astro 2020 papers that kind of review the status of light relics um, and motivations and, and things like that. Furthermore, um, this is much more than just a blind search. Specifically, we can make very concrete predictions about the expected contribution to an effective from any given set of light thermal relics. That is, if we had light species that were in thermal equilibrium with a hot, dense plasma in the early universe, we can predict its contribution to an effective just by knowing its uh, number of degrees of freedom associated with its spin and the temperature at which it decoupled from the plasma. And we can do this in the same way that we do for neutrinos. We figured out the neutrino temperature just by saying that electrons and positrons annihilated heating photons relative to the neutrino background. The same thing would be true if uh, we had a new light species that decoupled at some higher temperature. All we have to do is count up um, the entropy conservation of all the stuff that annihilates between the decoupling time and the CMB, uh, CMB times. So here you can see that these little jumps in this curve come when various particle species annihilate, thereby heating photons relative to the new light species. Because we know the particle content of the standard model, we can make definite predictions of the contribution to an effective shown vertically as a function of the freeze out temperature shown horizontally. And the, these three different colored lines are associated with three different um, models of, of new light species. So a Goldstone boson is a single light scalar. A uh, vector boson is like a, uh, like a photon. Um, and a vial fermion is a, uh, yeah, like a fermion, a spin one half particle. And you can see that they make different contributions to an effective. Our current constraints from Planck basically re rule out any new light species that would have decoupled after the QCD phase transition. 
But with upcoming observations from Simon's Observatory shown here or CMBS4 shown here, we'll push to much higher uh, uh, freeze out temperatures and constrain particles that are much, much more weakly coupled because the interaction rate typically scales as uh, the coupling to some power. And so we are constraining by even small improvements in um, constraints on ineffective, we can push to orders of magnitude higher uh, freeze out temperatures and therefore orders of magnitude weaker couplings of any new light species. Okay, and so the way we make this measurement with CMB observations uh, relies on the way that light relics impact the cosmic microwave background power spectra. The mean density of the uh, light relics impacts the expansion rate around the time of recombination. It affects the amount of time that photons have to free stream, um, and that impacts the damping scale of the CMB. So you can see that by changing an effective over this very wide range, um, you change the damping scale, the exponential suppression that comes from diffusion damping of the CMB by changing the amount of time that the photons have to diffuse before, we, uh, before last scattering. Um, because of this exponential suppression in the damping tail, this very strongly favors measuring as much sky as possible. Um, the reason for this is that the noise in the CMB experiment um, it goes down you know, kind of linearly with the number of detectors or, um, or observing time or effort, um, but the signal is dropping off exponentially. And so you can get many more new modes by observing very wide patches of sky rather than by observing deep on a narrow patch of sky. And it's because of this that we push to as wide of sky coverage as possible um, in, observe, in, our, in our design of the CMBS4 uh, footprint. Um, so folks like Srini and Cynthia have been very involved in validating these, de these designs um, to show that we want to push for as much sky as possible to make sure we achieve the target for CMBS4, which is to push to 0.03 at one sigma. Uh, okay, so this might, s oh, yes. Yeah, so in the wide survey, we cover um, a very large fraction of the sky every day and often multiple times a day. And the reason for that is not for the light relics, but it's actually for the transient science case. Um, and so um, every, uh, every patch of sky that's observable from Chile gets observed at least once a day is kind of the design goal of the scan strategy. And actually factoring that constraint in with maximizing the sky coverage with uniform, with uniform depth um, is what places constraints on the scan strategy. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, Srini and Cynthia and I have been doing a lot of work validating. Every time there's a new scan strategy, we make sure that we still achieve the goal we're interested in. And one quick follow-up then. How uh, tightly do you localize the source in the wide survey? How, uh, the sources, like the transient sources? Um, so you can actually do it at some sub-beam scale. So the beam scale that, that we're we have planned for CMBS4 is 1.4 arc minutes, but you can actually localize the, uh, the source to you know, sub-arc minute scales. Um, but it's not, yeah, not, uh, not like arc second scales, unfortunately. All right. Um, okay, so this may have seemed like a bit of a diversion from the way I, I set this whole thing up was to say that lensing plays this dual role of being important for us to measure the growth of structure, but also as a hindrance to various science cases for which we care about the primary CMB. So let me come back and say uh, something else about lensing and the way it impacts our ability to measure light relics. In addition to the effect of the mean density on the CMB, fluctuations in the light relic density are also observable through their gravitational impact on the CMB. Um, specifically, fluctuations in free streaming radiation induce a phase shift to the cosmic microwave background power spectra. Um, and this is due to the fact that uh, the uh, neutrinos or any new free streaming radiation um, travel, uh, the fluctuations travel at a speed faster than the sound speed of the plasma, and that drags features, that drags the baryon acoustic, baryon acoustic oscillation feature to larger angular scales, and this results in a shift of peaks toward larger angular scales toward the left on this plot. Um, and this is observable, it's been constrained in data, and it can be used to distinguish between various types of radiation. Specifically, the neutrinos of the standard model free stream and induce this phase shift, but you could imagine a new light species which is self-interacting and fluid-like, in which it doesn't have this free streaming, it doesn't induce this phase shift, and you can actually use this effect to disentangle a contribution from a fluid-like species and a free streaming 
flake species, and we showed that you can do this in, uh, so this is an SM S4 forecast, here's Planck data to show that you can actually get constraints on these things and distinguish the nature uh, of the new radiation that you might hope to see in CMB data. Okay, so what does this have to do with lensing? Well, um, one of the effects of CMB lensing is that it smooths out the acoustic peaks of the power spectrum. This results from the fact that various regions of the CMB are magnified and demagnified. And so if you imagine that you started with spots that were all exactly the same size, the lens CMB will have those spots slightly larger and slightly smaller in some areas. And that obscures or that smooths out features in multipole space. So where you would have had a sharp feature, you're now smoothed that out over a wider range of angular scales. And this is shown using this kind of made up parameter of A lens, which is just scales the amplitude of the lensing. And as you increase the amount of lensing, you smooth out these acoustic peaks. Now, if you smooth out these acoustic peaks, you can less precisely characterize the position along the horizontal axis. It's easier to measure the horizontal position of a sharp feature than it is to measure the horizontal position of a wide feature. And so this motivates the fact that we should work to undo the effects of lensing, that is, de-lens. Um, by measuring a map of the lensing and undoing its effects, we undo this smoothing. We sharpen the acoustic peaks. Sharper acoustic peaks are easier to measure. And if we can better measure those acoustic uh, peak positions, we can better infer the uh, cosmological parameters that impact those peak positions, including, for example, the light relic density. Um, and so with uh, Cynthia and others, uh, we developed uh, a technique to do this, um, and uh, we showed that you get concrete improvements in your ability to constrain parameters um, by de-lensing the CMB. Uh, and to come back to your question, Felipe, the, um, the ability to de-lens is kind of shown here for, this is for TE, this is one particular spectrum. Um, lensed is shown in blue, unlensed is shown in pink. And then uh, various experiments with various levels of noise with CMBS4, uh, roughly the yellow, you can see how close you can get to recovering the unlensed spectrum. Uh, for the, again, this is some range of scales zoomed in on TE. And similar other, other results are shown elsewhere in our papers, for example. All right. And so when you sharpen these peaks, you can better localize the peaks. You can better measure the properties of the peaks. And this is just showing that. Um, this is showing the error on peak position and peak height um, for TE using the same notation as before. So the unlens is in pink. So if, in principle, you could observe the pristine unlensed uh, as if there were no lensing ever, um, you would see the pink line. Um, and the lensed is in, uh, is, uh, sorry, the this is all compared to the lensed. So this is how much better you would measure than compared to the lensed spectra. And you can see that for the various colors, we're doing this de-lensing, self-consistently treating the noise. And you approach very quickly the best you could ever hope to do in localizing the peaks as if there were no lensing at all. And this translates into better constraints on the cosmological parameters that affect peak positions and peak heights. And in particular, n effective is one such parameter. So because n effective induces this phase shift by better measuring, by better localizing the peaks, I can better measure the, uh, the light relic dens density. And um, this, uh, this shows how much I can improve compared to lensed constraints in blue. Um, D-lens constraints is green, in green is what we get if we do this process of lensing reconstruction and removing its effects. And then red is the best you could ever hope to do in principle as if the lensing were never there. And you can see that you improve the constraining power. You, get, uh, you go to lower errors and uh, you get better, you get uh, lower, closer to the unlens as, as a function of noise, as you lower the noise. Uh, and I'll just uh, uh, give a, a quick plug to Srini, who has, who has um, uh, folded this into the this, uh, validation and uh, pipe, validation forecasting pipeline in CMBS4 uh, based on the code that uh, Cynthia and I and others have, have written. Um, so this is now a part of the, the way we do forecasts in CMBS4. We take account of this benefit um, when we do our, our parameter forecasts. Um, it's uh, much more broad than just ineffective. You can generally improve any parameter that happens to impact the peak positions or peak heights. And this is kind of a, a way of showing that. This is the, the figure of merit on lambda CDM cosmology. Um, and you can see that you get a non-trivial improvement. Um, and sorry, on this one, going up is better. Um, this is the volume of the, uh, it's related to the inverse volume of the error ellipsoid in lambda CDM. Um, and so blue is what you would get if you didn't do anything. 
And then this green yellow is what you get if you delens, and then pink is what you would have if you, uh, if you could have the pristine view of the CMB. And you can see at the, at the noise levels of interest, this results in a non-trivial improvement um, roughly comparable to an increase in, uh, of a factor of two in detector years or observing effort, uh, which when we're talking about experiments that cost hundreds of millions of dollars is a non-trivial improvement. Okay. All right. Um, so um, even if you don't care about neutrinos, you don't care about new light degrees of freedom, the last thing I want to, the last section I want to discuss here is that there's a lot to look forward to with the high precision data of upcoming surveys. Um, and so I'll touch just very, very briefly on some other CMB secondaries that we can hope to extract for the first time in upcoming data. The basic idea here is that the CMB acts as a universal backlight. All of the stuff that intervenes between us and the surface of last scattering can in principle leave imprints and change what we observe in the CMB. We've already talked about lensing deflection, that is the structure between us and the, line of, and, and the CMB last scattering surface, um, bends the trajectories of the light and distorts the view. Uh, but the photons can also scatter in structure. Uh, that can result in various manifestations of the SZ effect, um, which uh, comes in kinematic SZ or, or uh, temperature SZ. Um, you can also get lensing from smaller structures and, and other things. Because we know the statistics, we know the distance at which the CMB exists, we can infer the properties of all these imprints. Uh, we, sorry, we can infer all these imprints and therefore get some science out of, out of looking for these distortions. Um, a concrete example of this that has not yet been detected is to observe uh, remote, quadru remote temperature quadrupoles using the so-called polarized SZ effect. The basic idea here is that we observe polarization in the CMB because there are temperature quadrupoles that exist around the surface of last scattering. Um, those, uh, that induces polarization uh, via Thomson scattering from that position. That happens also at reionization, but it also happens on free electrons that exist within collapsed structures like galaxies or clusters of galaxies. And um, the basic idea that we showed here is that you can uh, look for the polarized SC effect, that is the polarization along the line of sight of clusters due to the scattering of these remote quadrupoles, um, and you can hope to reconstruct that remote quadrupole, which gives you access to very large scale fluctuations that are not on our past light cone. And so you get new information about these large scale modes, uh, which are valuable for um, all, so all sorts of uh, useful things like constraints on non-Gaussianity, um, uh, things that might be related to anomalies. Here we focused also on reionization that you could hope to extract with a measurement like this. This will be observable, uh, the polarized, polarized SZ effect will be observable in CMBS4 cross galaxy surveys at, at high significance, at something like 12 sigma. <clears throat> um, there's also another effect that results from the transverse motion of clumps of stuff across our line of sight. Um, this is called the moving lens effect or the Birkinshaw gull effect. The basic idea is if you have a, a clump of stuff that moves um, across our line of sight, um, this results in a time-dependent gravitational potential um, that leads to a characteristic dipole pattern in the temperature of the CMB. Uh, and so we developed an estimator for this and showed that you can observe this, at, again, at high significance, something like 40 sigma with CMBS4 cross LSST in, in blue. Um, and again, this is valuable because you can measure the large-scale fluctuations that result in the bulk motions of things. Um, and the transverse velocities are very hard to extract from galaxy surveys. Um, radial velocities are very easy to extract by measuring redshifts. Transverse velocities are much harder, but this provides a method by which we can do it statistically. Um, the process of reionization, the process by which the universe transformed from being filled with a neutral gas to uh, a plasma at late times, um, necessarily took place um, in an inhomogeneous way. And this results in an optical depth that varies across the sky in a process called patchy reionization. We can hope to construct the change to, st or, sorry, the, this imprints a change to the statistics of the CMB, much like CMB lensing. And in fact, the effect is not totally distinct from CMB lensing. Um, and you can search for both of these things, but if you do so naively, you'll find that your inference of the patchy reionization field is biased by gravitational lensing because their effects are not totally distinct. So you can develop bias hardened estimators and that sort of thing, but the problem becomes a little bit complicated uh, because the lensing contributes both variance and a bias, a bias to this reconstruction. And so the problem is a little bit complicated. 
And so uh, along with a student of mine, Eric Guzman, who's an excellent, excellent student, we developed a machine learning approach to assess, uh, to, to deal with this, to disentangle various sources of secondary CMB anisotropy. And what we showed was that this works really, really well. Um, you basically get a, a nearly optimal reconstruction that's, that's mostly free from this bias that you would get when you naively, naively did this. Um, and so the machine learning use, uh, the use of machine learning here is basically to deal with this non-Gaussian, non-linear problem to disentangle um, the various effects on, on the CMB. Uh, we also extended our machine learning approach to another secondary uh, source of secondaries, and that's cosmic polarization rotation. This might be induced by any parity violating physics in the universe, like uh, an axion field that couples to photons, um, if you have parity violation in the, gra in the gravitational sector, or it can come from more standard physics, like gravitational, uh, sorry, magnetic fields um, that induce Faraday rotation um, in, in the CMB photons. Um, if this process is anisotropic across the sky, it also induces a change in statistics, much like CMB lensing and like patchy reionization, and you can search for it using the same sort of tools. And what we showed is that our machine learning network is capable also, in this case, of a very nearly optimal reconstruction of, of this anisotropic um, cosmic polarization rotation um, simultaneously with delensing and with, uh, with the patchy reionization reconstruction. Um, so these are just a, a, a couple of examples of the new types of signals that we can search for um, with upcoming CMB data that we haven't yet observed. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, uh, so it's a little bit technical, but the, da the dotted line here is the, what I've written. This is iteratively de-lens, demodulated, and de-rotated CMB, and that's shown in this red, uh, red dotted line. So this basically says, like, let's pretend there were no issues in doing a, a, a reconstruction using the standard quadratic estimator. You observe, let's say you reconstruct the lensing field. You subtract as much of it as you can. You reconstruct the modulation field, you subtract as much of it as you can, do the same thing for rotation, and then you iterate that whole process, ignoring whatever complications may arise from uh, the fact that you get non-Gaussian statistics at every step of the way. And if you iterate that, it eventually converges uh, to some finite noise, and that's what this line is. And it's been shown in simpler cases, like specifically for lensing, that that um, is a very, very good approximation of the maximum likelihood reconstruction, the best you can ever do, at least for that simple problem. And uh, so that's how we've defined nearly optimal in, in this case. So it's that very idealized, iterated uh, quadratic estimator reconstruction. Um, good. Yeah, Gil. Uh, great question. In this particular case, there's some effective beam scale. We had a pixel size, and so you don't have infinite information. You only go up to L of 4,000, roughly, in this, in this particular case. And that effectively gives you a noise at L of 4,000. All right. Um, great. So these are just a handful of examples. I have others that I could, uh, that I'm happy to discuss later, of, of new signals that you can search for with upcoming CMB data. But let me just wrap up by saying that the upcoming precision from these future surveys offers all sorts of new opportunities, uh, but also new challenges. And so we have to identify these new targets, but also develop new tools to make sure we can maximize the science. And that'll have a lot of benefit um, for particle physics, for cosmology, and also for astrophysics. And so with that, I will stop there, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks. Uh, another naive question, sorry. Uh, everything you said about clusters is statistical thing only, right? Uh, will we have any signs for individual clusters? Um, so uh, yeah, so the things that I talked about here absolutely are statistical. Um, are you asking like, can this, be do can this be done with targeted observations of individual clusters? Yeah, so that's been proposed um, for like, so yeah, the way I've described it here, um, you're sort of fighting against the statistics that you have a bunch of like low mass objects for which this effect is really, really small on an individual object basis. So you might wonder, can you do better by focusing all of your effort on, or a much larger fraction of your effort on an individual source where you know the optical depth or the number of free electrons in that cluster is much higher? Um, and the answer is that people have looked at that, and it is, uh, it would be possible um, if you had dedicated observations to go after a, sing a single object. Um, there's another way to phrase your question, I think, which is, um, could you do a template analysis instead of the type of thing that we're doing here? That's also been considered, 
Um, and that, uh, assuming that we did everything correctly in our statistical analysis, that should be commensurate. It should, you should get the same answer. Um, where you do a template analysis where you identify known clusters and look for this effect. Um, and those uh, agree, yeah, I didn't, I think, oh, I didn't put the reference up here, but there's another one that does, uh, there's a paper by uh, Thibault Louis that does, does that analysis. Yeah, Gil. Um, so you talked about an effective greater than three tells you there's new particles. What if it's 2.8? Yeah, great. So uh, yeah, I focused on these on these new species, but indeed, uh, n effective is a great measurement of the thermal history of the universe. If it's 2.8, um, there's a few ways that that can be achieved. Um, one is the neutrinos were not populated as we expected. It's kind of hard to arrange that just because of the way that we like we understand weak physics. Um, another way that's, uh, that's, in my view, a little bit more plausible is that you somehow heated the photons after neutrinos decoupled in a way that you wouldn't have expected in the standard analysis. Um, that can occur due to the like, late decay of some out of equilibrium particle. Um, it can occur um, if you change the expansion history, so if there's more expansion between, uh, oh, sorry that's, not, sorry, that's not quite right. You'd actually need to heat the photons. You need to add, add entropy. But that's an example. Out of equilibrium decay would, would do that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, as far as changes in the neutrino sector, you, need to, you would need to not populate the neutrinos. That's hard to arrange, not just because weak physics is hard, but you can imagine like oscillating into a new species. But if you're able to oscillate into the new species, um, it very likely still contributes to ineffective because it must be light um, at the same times. Um, so yeah, late decays. There's another way you can do it, which is um, you have the photons uh, transfer their energy to axions, which doesn't actually require heating the photons, but it means that the photons, uh, yeah, you, you, yeah, you can oscillate between axions and photons. Well, if there are no other questions, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks, you all. Thank you.